Okay, Lynn Waldron, Jack Carr. Here we are. With uh, a table full of goodies yeah. and Hemingway's typewriter. Yep, there it is. So right let's uh, let's dive in here. Sure. Because we've got all of the goodies and yeah. all of the gear. We're, we're both inveterate gearheads, as are many of your readers. Yep. So. Uh, yeah, you know, I'll start with, uh, well, I'll start with a, a couple of blades here. And this one is, uh, it's called, it's a karambit, but it's a karambito, after my friend Andrew Arabito, who does half-face blades out of San Diego. We were in the, the SEAL teams together. Uh, and so I wanted some really, I wanted the weapons to also tell a story. Um, not just about the weapons themselves, but about the people that are using them. So I use uh, gear, I use weapons, I use vehicles as character development tools. So uh, somebody likes a Land Cruiser, another person likes the Land Rover, somebody likes uh, leather, another person likes Kydex, uh, 9mm versus 45, like those, those sorts of things are all right. character development tools for me. Courtney boot, boots versus more modern Solomons. Right. So all those things tell a story because when I see somebody and I see them walking and I see what they're carrying, how they're carrying it, what belt it's on, uh, all those things tell me about them, tells me about their, their experience, and uh, tells me that story. So I use the, the same thing to develop my character. So uh, this one comes from a particularly nasty scene, one that I was a little bit worried about uh, because I thought that once it got to New York, that, that back there they'd be appalled. A bit uh, yes, right. about what uh, the character James Reese does with this particular blade in the first novel, in the Terminal List. So uh, a little bit of a spoiler spoiler alert, but it comes uh, it's from history, and I learned about it from Shining Path Guerrilla Movement right. in South America, and I learned about it from a guy that was involved with them in the 80s, and he was telling me this story, and I just thought, ah, I've got to incorporate this into the novel, and so so I did, and I after that I learned that other um, uh, First Nation tribes had also done it, where you gut someone and you make them walk around a tree, and so essentially they get eaten alive, um, and they're, they're attached to a tree by their intestines. So why did the character choose that? Uh, just because it's mean looking, it's attached to the, the it's, it's uh, developed by a seal, not the karambit, right. but this particular blade by Andrew Arabito. So uh, I just wanted something that tied back to seal community. And then it's not the end though, it's not the end of that, of that chapter because he uses this to gut, but he still needs a blade. So he keeps this one and he puts this one and it's a little smaller than this one. This is the, uh, the Dynamis, uh, but the Razorback, which is a little bit smaller than this, is the one that I use in the book because it's uh, named for a, a friend of ours, Adam Brown, who was, uh, who was killed, um, and his favorite team was the Razorback. So, uh, so it's a little bit smaller, the actual one, but it's really the same design. And so after the guy wraps himself uh, around the tree, James Reese, the protagonist, makes sure he stays there by, uh, by stabbing this into the tree with his intestines there. Yep, so the third one, third, uh, uh, novel, Savage Son, has a, a Hunter Skinner because the theme of that novel is exploring the dark side of man through the hunter-hunted dynamic. And this is the, the Hunter Skinner, also from my friend Andrew Arabito at Half Face Blades. And uh, just because of the hunting heritage attached to this, seal background attached to this, the theme of the story. So, uh, so this one makes an appearance. And then this is one of my favorite pieces of kit from the last few years. Um, it's a combat flathead, so it's like a screwdriver, but this thing's indestructible. You can use it as a weapon as well. But this thing is just sweet. Winkler Knives makes this, but uh, it's sold only through the Dynamis Alliance. My friend Dom Rasso, who helped design it with Winkler. And it's just, a, I mean, a pry bar. You can use it as a weapon. And I use this in the, uh, in the third novel as well. So uh, pretty cool piece of kit here. But then what most people ask me about is uh, it's also the, the symbol for uh, uh, this, this venture uh, is the cross tomahawks, which are on my, my hat here. But uh, from Daniel Wickler, he just makes such a distinctive tomahawk. And I mean, that's just mean looking. Like every, no one makes something like this. And it's just, you, as soon as you see this, you know it's a Winkler. Uh, and I've known him for, for years and he has a close connection to both the, the SEAL teams and to, to the Army Special Operations side of the house. And I knew that my character, because I needed something that tied, that was really primal, visceral, and tied to the history of being a warrior. And that was the tomahawks. And they're introduced very early in the terminal list, just on the wall of the house when a police officer is walking his way through. He's looking at family photos. He's looking at books on the bookshelf. He's opening some drawers and he sees these tomahawks on the wall. And of course that comes into play later in the novel. But and all right, let's get into some of the- Missiles. Yeah, we don't have everything here. There's a, right. if we were to have everything from the novels, it would fill up an armory. So, right. uh, so we have a, a few things here. And yeah, 365 right here. This is the, uh, the SIG. P365, that's uh, obviously is very popular. It's what I carry in right now. This one's yours right here. And uh, gosh, I love this thing. 
I, mean, I, was, I was hitting things at 100 yards with it out at Thunder Ranch last week at 50, 25, and uh, it just feels good, and it shoots so well. And right out of the box, good to go. You don't need to change out any sights. So I introduced this one, I think, in the second novel, in True Believer. And the first novel, the protagonist uses Glocks primarily, right. uh, 19 to 43. Um, and because back then, there was no right. P365s. It didn't right. exist when I was writing that. Yep. And then uh, we have this is yours, uh, the 320 Compact right here. And uh, this thing is pretty sweet. I was shooting this out at, uh, at Thunder Ranch the other day. It's a little smaller than the X-Carry, which I don't think they, they make anymore. But uh, this thing is is awesome. So uh, so those are those, and then we have some uh, some AK some, variants here, and these AK are yours. Variants. The AK stuff is due to me. So it's uh, it's I didn't get to do the foreign weapons course like a lot of the uh, uh, like the SF guys get to go through. We did like some fam type things, right. and we did uh, of course shot the RPG uh, just to make sure we were familiar with how it operated in case we did a battlefield pickup type thing. And uh, but uh, but I've been fascinated with this just because of the history. The history is so fascinating. There's a book called The Gun by C.J. Chivers that really it's a uh, it it. it it's tough because you think it's all about the AK, and I did when I picked it up, but it's really a history of firearms in general, starting with like history of gunpowder and then takes you all the way up through uh, AK-47, M16, and, and puts those together you know, as those are being developed, and it's just such a great book. So if uh, people are firearms enthusiasts and haven't read that, they should definitely pick that up. So the last thing are yeah. some examples, right? Uh, the, in, in multiple cases in all three of your novels, particularly in Savage Sun and True Believer, um, Scenes in Africa, scenes in Russia, scenes in places where um, bad guys and good guys don't always have this, uh, you know, tricked out new. Mm -hmm. uh, yep, yep. So this one here, this is from the Seiko Custom Shop, right here, and uh, yeah, it's just three seven five. H and H, uh, and with the Swarovski uh, one to six dangerous game scope, but uh, this is one I took to Africa while I was doing my research for the second novel and for part of the third, but uh, particularly for the the Mozambique parts of True Believer, and I knew I had to get that uh, local flavor to weave it in, right. and I had a whole I had maybe three or four different pages of questions that I was going to ask when I when I went to Mozambique, and I think I got most of them answered, and a whole lot more of course because you don't even know what you what you don't know when you, when you step into those situations, and I learned a ton that I got to weave into the storyline, particularly of, of True Believer. But, and so yeah, the most of the rifles that I talk about in the books are things that I saw people wearing uh, or using over there, like the boots that my PH used, like those are the boots that make it into the novel, um, that sort of thing. So the, the, the people that uh, I based, the, or the characters that I based, uh, uh, I based on real people that I met over in, in Mozambique in particular. So yeah, that's, that is that one. And then, then you brought this one, you brought, uh, you brought this guy, and because this is similar to one of the rifles that uh, Very I have one, one of the uh, one of the guys uses in uh, in Savage Sun, and that's a crazy action. So, right. bam! So that is that is uh, part of your yeah. sniper heritage. Yeah, think about that. That's so, this is the Mauser action. Correct. It's a Mauser 96, uh, 94, 96, which is the, is the same action, and essentially the Swedish. You're military. cocking it right here at this Cock stage. Cock on close. Right there. Correct. So that's why you have to really... Press it hard. Yeah. Hammer it home. Yep. Right. And so that caliber's killed more uh, moose and caribou than any other. And then this the is pretty cool. One, yeah. yeah. It's not really from the novel. It was just kind of a, a cool one that I, <laughs> that I wanted to show you. But uh, yeah, so it's a Remington 870. That uh, just looks really cool. Nelson Ford out in uh, in in Arizona put this together for me, and just a, a great guy. And I wanted some. I saw a friend who had one, and I said, uh, "That is a beautiful looking shotgun. Um, how do I get one?" So we searched around and found an 870, and then uh, gave it to him and had him go through it and and trick it out and uh, extend the magazine tube here and. It's just a, a beautiful shotgun. Yeah, so I love it. It just feels good. We have such a history uh, to this shotgun, so uh, so I love it. So, but there there's some some shotgun stuff in the in the third novel. Yeah. Uh, of course, it's uh, one of the ones that's more closely associated with Point Men in Vietnam, right? The Ithaca, uh, which I also will have in the collection one day, but uh, but it's I don't have it yet. So, once again, I love the love the blades, love these things, and use them to uh, to develop the characters and, and move the story forward. So. I don't just Google Navy SEAL knife and put what pops up into the end of the paragraph. There uh, there's a connection to, to that gear and it's in there. It's very purposely put in to help tell the story and develop the characters and move things forward.